everybody and welcome to dry dock episode 81 nothing much to say in the way of channel admin this week apart from the 100k subscriber giveaway winners all of your prizes have been dispatched where you have a physical prize incoming so they should be with you if they're not already with you by now they should be with you in the next few days um, if they haven't arrived by the end of this coming week do get in touch and i will obviously provide tracking information and chase down the postal service in question the only other thing to add is that for those of you who have been either on discord or on twitter you'll know that i've started posting some of the scans of various uh, archived ship photos that i'm trying to keep in the public domain i now have a fair number of those so instead of bombarding people with the uh, small tranches of them I'd like to be able to host them on a central site but I'm not entirely sure what the best photo hosting site is because I don't want to just stick them up on something uh, like Instagram or Flickr or something like that um, and I don't particularly want to just put them up on something like photo bucket either I'd rather um, one of these services where you actually have almost like a little dedicated web page style thing where people can go and access and I can annotate the appropriate information and hopefully people won't um, steal them and use them for commercial purposes. So yeah if any of you happen to know or have recommendations in that regard feel free to let me know in the comments below and hopefully in the next few weeks I'll be able to announce the the opening of the DRAC archive. So this week's questions are taken from the 5 minute guide to SMS Dresden dash Emden the two ship class there and the Honda Point disaster Wednesday video. So let's get on with questions. Dejan Gabrovsek I think asks why were the fourth and fifth King George V class renamed from HMS Beatty and HMS Jellico? So yes, fun fact: uh, the fourth and fifth King George V class were originally scheduled to be renamed H. Well, to be named, I should say HMS Beatty and HMS Jellico. Although some sources, albeit in the minority, say that there are actually six battleships planned, which would have been Anson, Beatty, and Jellico, but. The majority say it, four and five were supposed to be uh, beating Jellico. But anyway, the, the reason for this was, well, Jutland, and they were pretty much the most famous British admirals for at least a good century or so. For, as for why they were renamed, well, <laughs> ever since Jutland, there had been, and to a certain extent even today continues to be, a, a, shall we say, a degree of controversy over how it was fought and this was very much still ongoing in the 1930s so on the one hand you had certain part members of the British political establishment and the Admiralty who wanted to commemorate as I said the, the two most famous British admirals for a considerable portion of time but Ever since becoming First Sea Lord, Beatty had waged something of a publicity campaign trying to carefully shovel his mistakes under the rug and uh, downgrade Jellicoe's contributions considerably. Jellicoe, to his credit, didn't really like the idea of getting involved in a massive public slap fight with Beatty in an era when any kind of disunity in the Royal Navy could be seen as an excuse to for other services to try and get money off of them. Um, so... Although he did make some responses, Jellicoe kind of just sort of shrugged his shoulders and went, well, if that's what they want to think, let them stew in their ignorance, I suspect was basically his his, his primary motivation. Unfortunately, um, BT and Jellicoe both had the temerity to die in the mid-1930s, which meant that with their funerals and such, the whole issue was blown back open again to a certain degree. This obviously didn't go down too well um, in the political and admiralty circles, and so it was eventually decided that 
perhaps BT and Jellico were a little bit too recent and therefore a little bit too controversial to be naming battleships after just yet. And so they reached back into the Age of Sail and pulled the names Anson and Howe out of that particular pool, and hence the two King George V class were renamed as such, although it should be noted that the renaming didn't take place until pretty much 1940, so when you see that old famous um, newspaper spread showing how the fleet was going to be, which was manu- uh, made at the end of the 1930s, the two ships are still called Beatty and Jellico in that spread. So yeah, that's uh, the story of the missed ships. Um, I personally would support naming one of uh, the Royal Navy's newer ships HMS Jellicoe, because I think enough time has passed and uh, history is a bit clearer as to who was responsible for what. And, well, I suppose if they want to name a support ship HMS BT, I can allow that. It might do something useful for a change. Alan Carey asks... I understood that Von Spey was worried about HMAS Australia, so I wondered how a battle between the East Asia Squadron and the Australian Squadron sent to recapture a ball would have worked, um, assuming no tactical advantage other than between the ships themselves. So the reason Von Spey chose to skedaddle to the other side of the Pacific at the start of the war was a combination of the Australia Squadron and the Imperial Japanese Navy, obviously the Japanese joining the war on the side of the British Empire due to the Anglo-Japanese Naval Treaty, but that left him horrifically outmatched, and so, well, away he went. He was, however, also specifically worried about the Australia squadron, even if the Japanese hadn't joined in, because of the presence of the battlecruiser HMAS Australia. Now, historically, we know what happened when the East Asia squadron ran into a pair of battlecruisers, but in this situation, there's only the one. Now, von Spey took the fairly sensible decision that even before the war started that he couldn't actually fight the Australia. Um, So that kind of gives an idea of how he thought things would go. But the order of battle in the well neutralisation of what was then a German-held territory was quite interesting. So you had the Australia, you had two of the town-class light cruisers, the Melbourne and Sydney, Um, an older uh, Challenger-class cruiser, the HMAS Encounter, which was a protected cruiser, but one of the larger ones, three destroyers, and, uh, well, a couple of submarines, one of which vanished, and the various other uh, ships associated with the actual invasion itself. So looking at just the military units, there is, however, one other vessel that wasn't from the Royal Australian Navy that came along for the ride, which was the French armoured cruiser Montcalm. Mount Calm, if you're going to be British about it. Um, And that composition of forces, although it makes it a closer battle on paper, you might think, because there's near enough as makes no difference, a one-on-one matchup, it does leave von Spee at a significant disadvantage because his three cruisers are all armed with lighter weapons, 4.1-inch or 105mm weapons, and likewise, they're relatively lightly protected. The two town class are a league ahead of the German uh, cruisers that they'd be protect, they'd be facing, um, seeing as that well, they're bigger, they're heavier, and they're armed with a main battery of six-inch guns, um, and they're probably faster at that point, to be honest. The and even the uh, the Challenger, the much older vessel, that is still about the same size as the towns and still covered in six inch guns so in a in the duel of the protected cruisers the australian force has a significant advantage and it's very likely that melbourne city and encounter will make relatively short work of the three smaller german cruisers assuming that uh, they don't just uh, withdraw now in the larger units you have the two Scharnhorst class armored cruisers now, Montcalm is not a terrible ship. It's as heavily protected as the German ships in terms of absolute belt thickness uh, at its thickest point. It's not as heavily armed, and it does have a mixed main battery, which does put it at a slight disadvantage. But then, on the other hand, you have Australia, which is uh, 
bigger, faster, more heavily armed, and just as, if not better, protected. And that really is the elephant in the room. Um, Australia definitely can take out one of the two. Montcalm versus the other one, the French ship has a slight disadvantage, but not enough of one to make it a quick one-sided battle. Um, I mean, assuming, say, that Australia takes on Scharnhorst, I'd probably put 60-40 odds on Nisenau taking Montcalm, but it could go either way. Um, it, it's relatively close. But to be perfectly honest, it's going to take long enough, for, uh, even if uh, Nisenau manages to take out Montcalm, it's going to take long enough to do so, barring random chance, that the town class and the three destroyers, bear in mind which the Germans have no answer to, will almost certainly finish off the three German light cruisers, assuming that, well, the town class and the, the encounter can do that on their own, even if the destroyers go after the armoured cruisers, which makes things worse for the armoured cruisers. But basically what I'm getting at is the light cru the light dash protected cruiser fight is going to be won by the Australian Navy. Australia is holds all the cards facing off against Scharnhorst, which means that all of those winners plus the destroyers, are going to be able to support Montcalm, which will probably save it, if indeed it needs saving, from Nisenau. So, yeah, it would be a lot closer battle, and I don't think anyone's going to come out of it undamaged, but there's a very good reason Von Spee didn't try to fight them. Ziga Auer asks a number of questions, all related to the same subject, which is pre-World War One light cruisers, Specifically, why were almost all pre-World War One light cruisers armed with guns that only had gun shields and not turrets, and in single mounts rather than twins? Why did these ships employ not? Why did so few ships, sorry, employ a unified centerline battery with many having guns spread out all over the ship? And why were super firing gun mounts so rare on these cruisers? An awful lot of it can be answered by the same two. Uh, same two statements, which is weight and machinery. So I'll explain in a bit more uh, detail. So super firing mounts being rare, um, yes, they were. And that was because these ships were actually pretty small. As you can see pictured here, this is a town class cruiser, a British vessel. But f even for a so-called second class cruiser, which was, as we said, the British term for protected cruisers, um, even for a protected cruiser, um, they these vessels were one of the larger ones, uh, sort of around about 5,000 ton displacement. There were an awful lot of uh, light-protected dash cruisers at the time that were even smaller than this. So they weren't particularly large ships, at which point having a gun armament of any description, whether it be a 4.1-inch or a 5-inch or a 6-inch gun, or a 5.5-inch gun in the case of a few, the these guns weigh a fair bit relative to the displacement of the ship and the higher you put a heavy weight in a ship the more that affects stability so if you're going to have centerline mounted armament on a ship of this kind of scale if you make those mounts super firing you've increased the level of one of those guns by at least a deck and that is going to have some serious weight and stability implications for your ship and coupled with the fact as you can see here there's really not actually that much space to have uh two centerline guns forward or aft um super firing some of them did have a couple of super firing aft guns because there's a little bit more real estate after the funnels than there is forward but those tended to be until you started to see the deployment of the world war one period cruisers which were a bit larger those tended to be smaller weapons um, as I say, when, when you got into World War I, then ships started getting larger, which meant more length, which meant uh, more space to actually put the guns in the first place, and also more displacement, which meant if you're using the same calibre of weapon, the overall effect of putting one of those guns higher was less in terms of stability. As for what, why the guns are spread out on the sides, well, this comes down to machinery. Because an awful lot of these ships, 
were still using, when they were built, were using the vertical triple expansion engine. And even the turbine-powered vessels, given the relative inefficiencies of machinery at the time compared to what the advances that would be made in the interwar and World War II periods, these took up a lot of space if you wanted to go fast, and cruisers had to be able to go fast. Um, and so this is why you ended up with things like these these four funnel arrangements and such like. The funnels themselves obviously take up a lot of centerline real estate that you then can't use for guns, and the engines themselves, especially if they're the older older style cruisers with the triple expansion engines, would come up quite significantly into um, the upper portions of the ship's hull, which would mean that you couldn't position a gun over it, because even if you didn't have a funnel directly in the way, putting a gun between the funnels would both restrict its arc of fire quite significantly on either side and also be a relatively unpleasant experience for the gun crew, considering how hot funnels can get when the ship's running at high speed. But also underneath there'd be no space for shell room storage, magazines, etc, etc. And, well, with even with a turbine ship, even if you could, I'm not necessarily sure well, packing several tons of high explosive directly over a very warm engine room is necessarily the wisest of ideas. And this meant that because of the aforementioned reasons for why you didn't do much super firing or extended centerline batteries for and after the ship, if you wanted to have a decent armament, you were basically forced into wing-mounted guns. And once you're forced into wing-mounted guns, well, obviously they can't fire on both sides. And so you end up, as you mentioned in your question, with ships that have 8 to 12 guns, but might only have 4 to 6 gun broadsides, depending on how well those guns are laid out. And then finally, when it comes to the guns being protected in gun shields as opposed to turrets, again, it's the weight issue mainly. Um, a gun turret, or at this point, well, depending on exactly what point you're looking at, the fully enclosed and armoured barbette, weighed an awful lot. Um, you, I mean, look at the size that USS Olympia had to get to just in order to have a couple of turrets, albeit for relatively large guns for its era. But... Yes, generally turrets weighed a lot, um, whatever version of turret they were in, and that's just the turret. That's before you actually put any kind of significant armour on them. If you start putting significant amounts of armour, then you have, again, the problems of weight and stability, which uh, will reduce the number of guns you've got. And to be perfectly honest, the amount of armour that you need to meaningfully protect a turret against similar scale opponents probably you're talking two to three inches of armor at minimum once you multiply that out across all these guns you're going to have to start cutting something if you don't want your ship to roll over so it was generally held to better to have more guns so you had a meaningful broadside than a ship that was armed with three or four guns that might last fractionally longer because at the end of the day these cruisers weren't the most heavily protected so um it was better to hit your opponent many times and set them on fire and put holes in them than it was to well possibly have your guns as the only surviving part of the ship um now that runs into the other part of why use twin ma uh, single mounts instead of twin mounts and it basically comes down to the fact that miniaturizing the twin mount was something that was still had work on going during this period obviously had been done for battleship scale armament and it was done in certain um, nations especially in the 1900s for the heavier secondary batteries or eight inch batteries for example um, and a few of the slightly smaller ones but at the end of the day a twin mount generally is going to load and fire slightly slower than a single mount and you know, with these cruisers, rate of fire was everything. And by putting two guns in one place, you risk losing both guns at, in a single hit, which in turn meant that it wasn't practical or wise to do so unless you heavily protected them, which leads us back to our issue with the turrets. So it was, again, held to be better to use gun shields to protect against splinters and have more of them because then... If you lost a gun, well, okay, fine, you've lost a gun, but there's plenty more of them around. That isn't to say that gun shield designs were all created equal. 
um, there was quite a bit of uh, consternation when the Chester and Birkenhead were brought into Royal Navy service, having originally been designed for the Greek Navy, and it was discovered that their gun shields didn't go down all the way to the deck. They kind of stopped about two, three foot above the deck, and everyone was looking at that going, yeah, when splinters are scudding around the ship, that is going to be a very bad time to be a, sh a shin. And as it turned out, um, when Chester especially took a heck of a battering at Jutland, an awful lot of the gun crews who were lost or badly injured were killed or badly injured by shell, shell splinters skittering under the gun shields and taking out their legs. Um, and at the end of the day, um, the gun shield, as I say, would, it would protect against splinters and such like from near misses or hits on other parts of the ship. But it, yeah, it's not going to protect you from a direct hit from an equal size shell. But as we covered with the turret issue, there wasn't really much else you could do in that respect without making the cruisers bigger. And it's when the cruisers become bigger that you start to see heavier protection and people start to join gun mounts together. So say, for example, in the armoured cruisers of the period, the last few generations of armoured cruisers, you did start to see twin mounted heavy, heavy guns and medium guns. And just to give some idea of the kind of weight implications we're talking about, using this as an example, so the latter town classes carried an armament of eight six-inch guns, a uh, belt armour of three inches, um, as obviously being cruisers relatively quick for their time, and displacing around 5,000 tonnes. When you skip forward to the 1930s, albeit that they are faster and therefore require more power, but machinery has advanced significantly, so the space uh, required for a given power of machinery has dropped dramatically. But look at the Leander class, also armed with eight six-inch guns, but in twin turrets in two super-firing pairs. With that armament, and as we said, just a little bit more machinery, the displacement of those ships went up to over 7,000 tonnes. And so you're looking at about a 40%, 40 to 45% increase in displacement. No actual relative change in armament, albeit a greater broadside weight because they're all centerline. And the Leanders were arguably, in certain respects, actually worse protected than the towns because the towns had a three-inch belt, this, this version of the towns, that is, um, whereas the Leanders, as built, only had three-inch box protection, so they didn't have a continuous three-inch belt. So that gives you some idea of the sacrifices you need to make uh, in terms of just how much extra you, your ships end up weighing in order to get centerline super-firing turreted armament as opposed to gun shielded single turret guns distributed across the ship as a although there is a slight qualifier to that because the leanders were significantly faster so take that as you will keith moore asks how do they get magnetic compasses to work at all on a steel ship well that's a very good question actually and one that was wrestled with quite considerably in the 19th century as they suddenly realized to their horror that <laughs> The magnetic compass, which was used for a lot of navigation, was somewhat useless when you surrounded it with a massive several thousand ton lump of ferrous metal in the form of an iron-hulled, iron-clad warship. And, well, steel is an, an alloy of iron, so much the same principle applies. Now, the, the way to solve this problem, which is effectively, well, the, the natural uh, ferromagnetic properties of the ship's hull, plus of its interaction with any electrical fields that might be on board, which became a factor later on, as well as its own interactions with the Earth's magnetic field as it turned and moved, would throw a compass off quite badly. So it was eventually found that this little thing, the marine compass setup you can see in the picture above, was the best way of doing so. So this uses those two big iron balls, which, uh, shockingly enough, initially were cannonballs. <laughs> yes, that to answer that inevitable question, uh, but later on would be custom-made. They These are positioned one to either side of the compass, and what's also relatively less known is that there would also be a core of soft iron mounted within the support structure itself, i.e. in this uh, the wooden casing underneath. And the idea is that these 
compensate locally for the f effects of the ship's hull. And there would also be a series of small permanent magnets installed which would be calibrated to a particular ship because obviously if you're trying to fit one of these to say uh, a 2,000 ton third class cruiser that mm, there's going to be maybe a few hundred tons of iron or steel in that whereas if you're trying to fit it to a 16,000 ton pre-dreadnought battleship there's considerably more and considerably more concentrated ferromagnetic material in that particular vessel so by using the the two iron balls and the iron bar underneath that would create a, a sort of a, not quite a dead zone but a compensated for zone that the compass could operate in and then say an extra correction using permanent magnets it's uh, it's all very interesting bits of uh, magnetic electromagnetic physics Connor McLernan asks, given the improved metallurgy of today, if a modern navy were to construct a battleship, leaving aside the impracticalities, how much better would armour be now compared to the armour present during World War II? Um, well, my was a bit of a surprise that actually not that much better without going really exotic, and to be perfectly honest, we probably couldn't even match what was done in World War II without an awful lot of preparation and a massive amount of money invested. Now, you might think, well, what on earth are you talking about, Track? Well, the simple fact is that, as I've covered in a few other um, questions and videos, the infrastructure to produce massive foot-plus-thick slabs of steel that are differentially hardened front and back is fairly extensive but also fairly niche to the point that in the run-up to World War II uh, the UK was having to Im import armour from what was then Czechoslovakia to make up for shortfalls in armour production in its own industries because the armour industry had declined in the treaty period to a point that it couldn't actually supply everything that was needed uh, for British ships and obviously for what they did need in terms of the really big heavy plates was um, that that's where the British armour manufacturers were concentrating their output and so the smaller well thinner plates and such like and the more homogeneous plates were outsourced and you can imagine having not actually manufactured any battleships since pretty much just after the end of World War II steel makers don't keep that kind of heavy industry and factories around for no particular reason for 70 plus years so we'd actually have to adapt existing infrastructure or potentially build entirely new infrastructure just to be able to recreate what was made for battleships in the second world war now that said there have been some advances in steel manufacture that could in theory lead to a superior quality of steel plate once all that machinery had come back in place, albeit that I rather suspect without even further investment in all sorts of fancy sensor equipment and computer controlled timing and uh, other machinery that the quality level, at least for the initial batch runs, would probably be well below what the World War II factories were capable of putting out so it would kind of balance out until a bit more practice had been gotten in or as I say unless someone developed a really clever set of computer programs and uh, robotic handlers to actually control things like the heating and the cooling which to be perfectly fair they probably would I mean if you're going to spend this kind of stupid money you might as well throw a couple of extra billion in there um, for fun if nothing else but at the end of the day, the quality of the metal that was used in, say, the Italian, um, British and American and German, actually, to be honest, armors and their relative production techniques, they're all known. And so incorporating the uh, slightly improved modern metallurgy in the area of uh, carbon steels would result in a somewhat better protected ship. But I suspect the it wouldn't be that much more. Um, I mean, as we covered in the video on armour, a lot of the protective measure uh, qualities of armour depended as much upon the relative thickness of the hardened outer plate as it did the actual quality of the metal itself. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be 
betting on some sort of being able to say match the protection of an Iowa class using eight inches of modern steel. It's that's not going to happen. I mean, it's, you if you replicated the Iowa class's armor scheme in its entirety with modern steel, modern equipment, all this computer control stuff, you could maybe maybe get away with eleven inches instead of twelve. But this is where we get into the exotics. The two things you've got to think about is what are you trying to resist these days? And therefore, how much even more ridiculous money are you trying to spend? Now, some of you might be thinking, oh, well, why do you go titanium? Titanium's not actually that much stronger than steel. What titanium is, is lighter significantly, which means that for a given level of protection, you or strength, I should say, you can use titanium instead of steel and your overall result will be lighter. So this is why, for example, the Soviets developed a lot of titanium technology for the MiG-25 and the MiG-31, because you could make a MiG-25 or a MiG-31 out of steel, but by the time you'd made it thick enough and strong enough to withstand the kind of speeds that they encountered going up to Mach 2.5 and Mach 3 and above, you've basically got a flying ingot, so not particularly useful. Whereas with titanium, it's got the strength um, and it's relatively lighter. It's the same thing actually with medieval reenactment. You, when you get, a, a say, a titanium brigandine, which is a coat of plates, you won't be getting a titanium brigandine that's anything substantially thinner than the steel ones you'd be getting, but it'll be a heck of a lot lighter, <laughs> which makes you more mobile. So, in theory, you could make a kind of compound titanium armour. So, because you've still got the hard face, soft back issue that you'd need to resist massive kinetic impact. So it wouldn't be a pure titanium armour, but you could effectively revive the old compound armour and go for a, a, a softer steel back with a titanium face and then... Because it's lighter, you could then make it thicker, which would improve dramatically the amount of protection that you'd get in exchange for the same weight. So again, let's say we're replicating an Iowa class's armor, you might be able to get two, three more inches of armor onto there without changing the weight if you make the hardened part of the armor into titanium instead of steel, albeit you've then got to have the, the fun um, engineering challenge of trying to weld titanium onto steel and uh, yeah i'll be i'll be anywhere but where you're trying to do that if you don't mind um it is it's very difficult i mean it's hard enough getting titanium to stick to itself never mind anything else but this is all still looking at your your basic incoming large projectile of some description slamming into solid object and hopefully breaking before the solid object does these days, obviously, you do have um, shaped charges, squash head explosives, etc., etc., and we have discussed as to why these kinds of things are possibly not necessarily the most effective compared to a shell that punches through. But then, on the other hand, when you're, say, the Russians and you're firing a missile the size of a large bus at your opponent, your warhead can be pretty darn big, at which point quantity has a quality all of its own and well a, a one ton shape charge warhead is still going to blow a very big hole in the side of a ship um now with tank armor obviously tank armor has gone over to composites uh, quite a bit both to help resist that kind of assault and obviously also with things like whatever the heck they use in dorchester level two armor in the british army or um the adapted Cobham armor that the US Army uses with its depleted uranium pellets because they've got to deal with the aforementioned sort of shape charge issues as well as the hypervelocity kinetic penetrator rounds, which I suppose crosses over with rail guns when you come looking to the future of ships. So when it comes to that stuff, well, this kind of is why I don't cover the modern stuff so much because who knows what the heck they put into Dorchester Level 2, or to a certain extent, even uh, the American uh, imp versions of Cobham. We know it's ceramic and 
in the American case, some depleted uranium and steel and some other stuff and question mark, question, question mark. Protection? <laughs> um, I guess they could try and put that stuff on instead. Um, and obviously it is superior to just rolled homogenous steel armor, but battleship plate isn't rolled homogenous steel armor either. Um, and nobody really has done any cross comparisons between the two. So how much more or less effective against the kind of threats a warship would face between the two armors? Who knows? Um, apart from anything else, to be perfectly honest, you can't really do a comparative test using a modern tank because if you fire a 16-inch shell at the tank, just due to, due to the sheer kinetic energy of that thing, there's probably not going to be much of the tank left, regardless of whether or not the armor kept the technically kept the shell out or not. It, naval warfare is a whole other scale. Tashi asks, I, um, I recently watched the new Midway movie. It has a scene in which the Japanese Admiralty wargame the upcoming Battle of Midway, which makes me wonder what kind of rules are used in this kind of simulation? Do they use dice or any other random element? Or are they more like chess? How complex are the rules? And are any of the rule sets publicly available? How do they differ between different navies? So naval war games are a very complex beast. And the short answer is that there is no one correct answer when it comes to these kinds of things. In terms of the rules and their complexity, it varies on how they do it. Um, there are cases of naval war games legitimately being done by actual navies using models, paper counters, etc. on a tabletop in a room between various teams of officers. But it's also scaled up from that kind of stuff through the semi-tabletop semi-simulation, which is kind of the level that I tried to, I've tried to use when... Um, I've done the occasional video where we've wargamed out results, which gives a little bit more accurate um, information because it incorporates a lot more human factors than just dice do, all the way up to actually legitimately taking your fleet, splitting it in half and saying, you're one side, you're the other side, these are your objectives. Um, basically, go out and do what you would actually do with the exception of the whole actual blowing up part. Um and this can include anything up to and including firing of real live torpedoes just without warheads, which does occasionally lead to interesting things when something goes slightly wrong and a submarine or a ship falls into port with, with a practice torpedo sticking out of its hull. Um, and obviously the rules for that are considerably different for the rules of, well, here's a couple of admirals and some models on a, on a bit of blue cloth, have fun. Um, so, yeah, complexity of the rules varies massively. Um, there are always, almost always arguments over this. I mean, various Japanese and American, and well, anyone, almost anybody's war games, to be honest, up, in, up into World War II and beyond, have always been dogged by various sort of sore losers on one side or the other, deciding that the rules are unfair and therefore... The outcome was unrealistic, and so I'm just going to randomly either reset the game or ignore the the rule set, or um, I've come up with this exploit that is technically not against the rules, but everyone kind of possibly loses sight of the fact that's not actually how real life works. Um, when people think of it more and more of a, as a game rather than uh, an actual real life challenge, it, this is when you start to get rules lawyers, even when you are talking about like proper professional naval officers because they're all human um so yes it it can be it can range from as i say live combat only with non-explosive weaponry all the way down to roll of a dice and oh look yes uh, i rolled a double tw double six therefore your battleship explodes kind of thing in terms of the rule sets publicly available um there are some from the period, from the sort of the pre World War II period that are available for people to peruse. Um, if you happen to be in the States, you, it's more easy to get hold of the documentation for it. But the fleet problems uh, that were run during the interwar period 
in the mostly in the 1930s are actually a very interesting example of naval war games and you can get a hold of most of the documentation for those relatively easily and they provide a lot of insight into how the full-scale live naval war games developed. There's also a bunch of stuff that's available in the UK from pre-World War One naval war games where they ran pretty much the same kind of stuff, um, which is, quite again, quite interesting to read, um, albeit that there's so much information generated by these war games because at the end of the day they are supposed to inform future fleet strategy upon which the fate of a nation might rest that <laughs> there's usually not too many summaries that are particularly useful beyond telling you what the outcomes and highlights were um so th th i think the the rules just the published rules for one of the fleet problems is a like a heavy tome in and of itself and as for the tabletop versions well some of the uh better existing sort of civilian available tabletop rules for fleet games are fleet war games are pretty much on a par with some of the more basic stuff that the the military would use i mean you've got to remember that um something like say jane's fighting ships was originally started to inform uh naval war gamers of the capabilities of the various ships that they would be simulating so the the better rule sets for naval tabletop war gaming in in the general civilian world are not too far removed from the more basic tabletop thought exercises that the military might undertake especially when you go back into the earlier realms of world war one world war two and that kind of period where it's a lot easier to extrapolate and abstract relatively basic things like gunfire as opposed to the complex interplay of radar jamming other electronic warfare missile seeker heads bombs stealth aircraft etc and infrared sensors and such like which they have to factor in today and if you think that the navy's letting the exact rules of those war games out of anywhere out of the bag then anytime soon you've got another thing coming um so yeah admiral tiberius asks a question that is so glorious it really must be read in its entirety you've been transported back to 1910 and you've been placed in total command of all aspects of ship construction, ship repair, ship design, and technology for the United States Navy. You have all your modern knowledge of uh, all the mo your modern knowledge, and Congress has been locked in a room with an angry grizzly bear until they approve a budget around 75 to 80 percent more than what they historically gave the Navy at this time. You have until 1920. How do you prepare the U.S. Navy for World War One and the future? And what ship designs do you cancel or push through, etc., etc.? He says, I've also sent some budget figures for the US Navy via email to help you out. Thank you very much. Well, I think my first step would probably be to a vote to increase the number of grizzly bears represented in Congress, because I think that would greatly improve the passage of laws in that particular situation. But that's not necessarily a naval matter. Now, yes, the history of Congress appropriations for the Navy in the 1910s is quite funny. I and mean, you look through it um, using the figures that uh, very kindly sent to me, and it's sort of around about $140 million, give or take a little bit, throughout most of, uh, well, the early part of the 1910s, then 1916, and then 1917, $1.4 billion. It's like, oh. Okay, apparently you had ten times as much money hidden somewhere. That must be a very big sofa you're keeping all the nickels and dimes behind. So that immediately gives you an idea of the relatively limited scale that we're looking at. It's not going to be the actual wartime US Navy budget. We're talking about a Navy budget of about 220 to $250 million in 1910s dollars. Um, so in terms of new acquisitions and design changes... The big thing, to be honest, of all of it is the fact that I'm allowed to keep all my uh, current modern knowledge. So with that, there's some minor design changes I'd make in terms of things like scrapping the cage masts and forcing the US Navy back to the good old tripod mast uh, for a start. But with this extra money, I would also make a number of other changes. I mean, firstly, just to increase the general lethality of the US Navy, I'm going to take my future knowledge of how to fix the problems with the 14-inch guns um, and being too close in shell interference patterns and everything. I'm going to take that back with me so that the standard class are a bit more effective straight out of the box. The next thing I'm going to look at is actually the ship's propulsion, and that might affect the overall hull shape as well, because 
what I will know in advance is that the 21 knot battle line is not really going to work. And I've got the money now to pay for it. It's going to be okay-ish for World War One, but once you get into the interwar period and then into World War Two, the fact these ships are going to be capable of 21 knots just isn't going to cut it. So I would try and aim for something more along the lines of at least 23, possibly even pushing 25 knots. So effectively, rather than building the US Navy equivalent of, say, the R class, even though they, even they ended up at 23 knots in their original form, I'm going to aim more towards trying to do the US Navy equivalent of a Queen Elizabeth class. If that involves making a few sacrifices in armament, say going for a Nevada style layout instead of the uh, four triples, well, I wouldn't, I prefer not to make that sacrifice. And I think I've got the money just to make the ships a little bit longer to introduce, well, both a better uh, length to width ratio and also uh, the additional power plant that would be needed. So th the armor of the standard class, I mean, obviously make some tweaks to it, but you've already got all or nothing reasonable torpedo defense for the time. The main thing is speed. So make the ships a little bit bigger, a little bit longer, a little a bit more powerful in terms of the engines so that they're pushing sort of 20, probably say around about 24 knots realistically. That means that not only do I now have a lot more effective battle line in terms of being able to dominate uh, enemies in t uh, speed wise, but it also means I've got the volume of engine space such that inevitably at the end of the day when World War II rolls around, if the ships need uh, are then going to be modernized, packing in modern machinery into most, if not all, of that machinery space might even push the ship speed up another couple of knots. Now, that's still not going to make them aircraft carrier escorts, but it will make them a lot more useful in the Pacific theater and the European theater, for that matter, because they're going to be kind of at this inter intermediate point where they're going to be faster than almost anyone else's battle line units. Not, I say, not quite carrier escorts, but they're only going to be a knot or two slower than something like, say, in uh, North Carolina. And also with that in mind, I mean, getting the basic design for a mass-produced fleet of destroyers will definitely be part of it, ready for the inevitable wartime budget and the ability to build massive swarms of the things. So a modified version of the Clemson's Dash Wix class would definitely come in handy, although I would probably run with the experimental fit outs that were historically installed on a couple of the Clemsons with the twin four inch guns and thus I would probably try and get a four gun broadside maybe with a twin forward and a twin aft um, and thus save a little bit of space from the offset guns that they historically had just so just minor revisions to the Clemsons but basically tweaking them to be ready for uh, the big build the biggest change and where I suspect most of my money would be probably be going would be going into cruisers because the US Navy at this point historically just can't afford any um, and so they don't have any and then at the end of the day what well, what do they get at, towards the end of it is the Omaha's which not the world's greatest um, so I would ad I would advise strongly against the insane speed and I don't think really legitimately in the First World War period you can build something that's going to be a still going to be a practical front line light cruiser by the time you get to World War Two. Um, I mean, the closest you get is some, something like maybe the C class in the Royal Navy. And even the Royal Navy had scrapped most of them and what was left, they were being converted into anti-aircraft ships. So they're way down um, on the list of things. But what you probably could do is some kind of relatively practical heavy cruiser and again because i've got my future knowledge i can kind of try and game the system a little bit because eight inch gun turrets those uh i know i definitely can do especially twins so i would probably take a lesson from the obviously you've got the triple turrets as well and the larger scale ships I'd probably try and invent something relatively close to what would become a standard uh, treaty era heavy cruiser, but earlier. So that would involve building up to the 10 
well, n roughly around a 10k limit, because again, future gaming, <laughs> gaming the system a little bit using future knowledge. Um, and within that, I would put in as much engine power as I could to uh, to get speed up. I don't need to hit 30 plus knots necessarily, but it'd be nice to hit the high 20s, 27, 28, maybe 29 knots. And then a main armament of probably four twin 8-inch guns in super-firing turrets. Um, probably slightly overdo the turret armour, um, which would be excusable at the time. And decent belt, etc. Reasonable secondary battery of some description. Now you might think, well, what's the point of this? Well, the point of this, again, because I'm gaming the system in the future, is that legacy ships in the, under the Washington Treaty had extra allowance made for anti-aircraft upgrades, anti-submarine upgrades, etc. Uh, mostly it was confined to capital ships, but you can probably finagle some kind of similar um, exemption or allowance in the Washington Naval Treaty for cruisers, given that I'm setting all this up in the first place. And so by having these slightly overweight turrets and this around about 10k limit, that means I can mainly emphasize the sort of the protection and and speed of the ships thus when it comes time to modernizing them again strip out the old engines put in newer more modern machinery that'll probably push them over 30 knots and still leave a little bit of uh, displacement spare and the slightly over egged turrets would mean that replacing a world war one vintage eight inch gun with say a twin eight inch gun of a more modern type such as the kinds that were being used in the new orleans class in uh, the 1930s would mean that i would have a nice solid heavy cruiser with eight eight inch guns uh, modern guns decent amount decent speed good armor protection and using my uh, slightly exploitative future gamed uh, adaptation claws I'd be able to probably add maybe another thousand tons or so in um, in displacement post treaty to install the inevitable anti aircraft armament, etc. Which would then mean that going into the Second World War, albeit that, yeah, they might be second line units compared to some of the more modern stuff, but they'd still be very viable and valuable units, which would benefit the US Navy greatly, I think, especially in the opening rounds of the Second World War. As compared, I mean, because we, we know in World War One the US Navy doesn't need a massive battle line, as it turns out. Uh, and so I'm effectively just building a future-proofed fleet. The one last thing would be, critically speaking, I'm not going to try any carriers or gaming a kind of HMS Furious-style absurd ship that can be converted. Because to be perfectly honest, the Lexington conversions are probably about the best you can hope for in a... 1910s that's early 1920s scenario uh, and so I'm not going to compromise that potentially uh, by building something or starting to build something that might end up as an inferior version let the 1920s come up with the Lexingtons and then have them cancelled by the treaty and turned into carriers that's probably about the best outcome for the US Navy that you can do on that front Timo Fibich asks, what was the most ridiculous capture of a warship in your opinion? Well, there's quite a few, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, and yes, the Dutch raid on the Midway does count uh, fairly high up amongst them, albeit that in terms of ridiculous surprise, the Medway wasn't so much of a surprise by the time it actually happened. The, the English kind of just watching this slow motion car crash of a disaster unfolding before them due to hilariously poor um, preparation beforehand but never mind in terms of ridiculously implausible and surprising captures the same name pops up an awful lot in quite a number of my candidates but i've chosen one um of them and that is this particular one you can see pictured this is the capture of the esmeralda by uh, thomas the lord cochran um and yeah, I say, he, his name shows up an awful lot when it comes to ridiculous captures of shipping, but this one I think really takes the cake. This was what was known as a cutting out operation, uh, which is an incredibly dangerous uh, type of naval operation in the Age of Sail that required a ridiculous amount of skill and a not inconsiderable portion of luck, and that involves finding an enemy ship at anchor, 
usually in a protected harbour, and then quietly and stealthily sending a significant portion of your own crew in in small open boats to then swarm up the side of the ship and capture it, hopefully before anybody notices and blows your boarding party clean out of the water. Um, so yes, a lot of danger and an awful lot of luck needed. In this particular case, the Esmeralda was one of uh, a few Spanish ships in the middle of the one of the various um, operations that the Spanish colonies in South America were trying to undertake for to, to, for their own independence. Um, and uh, Admiral Cochrane was leading the Chilean naval squadron because, uh, and that's why the second of the Almirante Latore class battleships were going to be named in his honour. Um, not just for this operation, but for all the various help he gave them. And it, it was a 1820, relatively quiet period for the Royal Navy, so what was a enterprising officer like uh, Cochrane going to do? Well, he was going to go wandering off to another navy that was having a war and exercise his command abilities there. So the Spanish ship was accompanied by other ships. It was a 40-gun heavy frigate, and it was under the guard of an entire armed fortified harbour, as well as its own crew, so you can imagine pretty hard to get at, get at. And outside were also two relatively recent opponents, the USS Macedonian, the former HMS Macedonian, um, along with a British ship that was also there to observe proceedings, the HMS Hyperion. And they were sort of watching the whole thing as neutrals. So Cochrane put together his boarding party and headed in to the Spanish harbour, came past the two neutral vessels, which basically did their own versions of, oh, okay, I see what you're doing there. Good luck. Um, this should be fun to watch. <laughs> and then promptly failed to tell the Spanish what was going to happen to them. Um, and yeah, he, he managed to sneak with the tacit assistance of the neutral uh, British and American ships into this incredibly heavily guarded fort, fortified harbour and steal the Esmeralda from under the guns of the fort and the watchful eyes of the uh, crew, or well, obviously not quite as watchful as they could have been, and take it away, um, instantly transforming the fortunes of that war and effectively wiping out major Spanish naval presence in the Pacific when it came to this particular conflict. So, yeah, that that's kind of ridiculous. It's like how to steal an enemy flagship from, effectively, their home port. I mean, it's, it's the equivalent, I suppose, of somebody... Let, let's say, if Pearl Harbor had, instead of being a massive air attack, if Pearl Harbor had been an attack of swarms of Japanese midget submarines loaded with troops that had come aboard the USS Arizona or the Pennsylvania... I know the Pennsylvania was in dock, but, um... Let's say the Maryland. Yeah, Maryland's probably a good one, because Arizona's a bit older. So, yes, it's, it's the equivalent of the Japanese carrying out Pearl Harbor by boarding and capturing the USS Maryland and then sailing her out of Pearl Harbor. Um... <laughs> completely under the guy the guns and eyes of the entire american fleet it's that ridiculous but he pulled it off and finally for this week class a cornate asks will you ever do a texel style war game over the infamous or famous question of what if bismarck turpitz the admiral hipper Scharnhorst, nizau and the deutschlands had sailed out jutland style to fight the home fleet in theory i could but to be honest Probably not, not unless, literally not unless somebody paid me. Um, the reason I say that is, one, let's face it, it's a question dash argument that's been done a million times, and there's people very entrenched on both sides, neither of whom would be happy with whatever result came out. The result came out with because the result would actually be vaguely realistic and not what everybody's hopes and dreams and thoughts and prayers say it should be. Plus... Unlike a lot of um, quote-unquote what-ifs, this one is actually... It's not that difficult to actually do, but it's very difficult to set the sides for. Because, well, 
the easiest thing is you've got to wait until Turpitz is actually physically ready to go. But you've then, there, there's so many variables because you've got to sort of think of, okay, well, we've got to wait till Turpitz is ready to go. We're going to assume that Bismarck and Turpitz don't get bombed and damaged in the interim. But then we've got to account for the historical damage that Scharnhorst and Neisenhow suffered around about this period. So is that, are we going to wait until they're repaired? Uh, in which case you're going to be waiting forever because obviously Neisenhow ended up being um, a little bit broken. Are we going to write off that incident? Or, and if we're going to write off that incident, are we going to write off the other incident? So is that that brings our dates forward um, and so on and so forth. So there's all these arguments that we had of, sort of when and when is the, the German fleet able to sail? Um, if we're aiming for all surviving Hippers, Deutschlands and all the capital ships, etc., and then based on that, you've also then got to try and work out what the British home fleet would have been at that point. Because, well, if they're with every variable and change that you make to the Germans, the British are going to have to respond to that beyond what they did historically, which it could lead to any number of combinations. I mean, if you if you want to go to one outlier, you might end up with, say, two carriers three king george the fifths um possi possibly possibly even more than that to be honest um but at least three it's sort of at least um king george the fifth prince of wales and duke of york if not anson or how whether or not hood is there or in refit whether renown or repulse or both are there whether um nelson or and or rodney are present and may maybe some of the modernized queen elizabeth's and if any of those aren't there where are they are they in the atlantic and therefore able to be scrambled in to come and help are they in the mediterranean the pacific or force h and therefore unavailable for any kind of rapid response etc 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 it goes on like this um and of course the instant you try and make any kind of decision on either side to establish date time and order of battle Everybody who for whom the battle battle's outcome doesn't favour their preconceived chosen side is immediately going to lay into you saying, oh, that's unfair, no, you should have done this, or the Germans wouldn't have waited that long, or maybe they would have waited that long, or maybe you put them out too early and the, therefore they didn't have their more most advanced fire control radar, or you've overdone the British, you've undersold the British, you've put the wrong mixture of ships in with the British, and so on and so on. It's uh, It would be a mess, and it's it's not... It's not the kind of mess I particularly want to have to deal with, um, un unless we did it some kind of community event where, with a lot of planning, a bunch of us got together and pre-negotiated and pre-agreed the rules, and then ran it through a decent wargaming system like the one I've been I used for Texel and Alternate Samar. In that case, if there's a, a relatively decent body of people who are willing to put the time and effort in. Uh, to help set it up and be happy with the sides in the first place. I mean, it's not going to stop the, uh, the the extreme ends of both both ends of the spectrum from complaining, but it hopefully should allay most people's fears that it wasn't just my arbitrary decision making. <laughs> so yeah, sorry about that. Um, I'll, I'll throw in an extra question as compensation. So to actually wrap up this week, uh, so long, John asks, what are the best? and worst moments in Royal Navy history. So I'm going to give two examples for both. I mean, with a with an armed service that's got such a long history as the Royal Navy, there's going to be dozens of moments you could point to as the best, and equally dozens of moments you could point to as the worst, um, and have reasonable justification for all of them. So I'm not necessarily going to go for a big bombastic battle or a huge um, colossal defeat for e any of my four examples, but I'll explain them uh, point by point. So for worst moments, I'd say the top worst moment has to be the infamous defence white paper that resulted in the scrapping of CVA 01 and 02 and 03 and, well, all the planned escorts for the, those ships. Uh, etc because i think that marked a major turn when the royal navy went from okay fair enough the u.s navy had gotten bigger at that point but it went from clearly having a vi vision to 
maintain itself as a major seagoing global power projection force to a state where, to be completely frank and honest, for a lot of the latter part of the Cold War, it was effectively NATO's biggest and best anti-submarine warfare force with ancillary attack sections sort of bolted on in the terms of things like submarines, the missile deterrent force, and the remaining carrier force. But the Royal Navy, at that point, it, it, it wasn't what it had been before. With the cancellation of those ships and the refusal to um, really extend the lives of most of what was already there for, an ex for much beyond that white paper, it was a huge climb down and yeah, probably one of the darker moments of the Royal Navy. The other one I would actually point to would be the collision of HMS Camperdown and HMS Victoria back in the 19th century, because that marked another low point in uh, the Royal Navy's fortunes. Now, admittedly, at the, that point, the Royal Navy was the biggest, most powerful navy on the planet and would remain that way for quite a while, but compared to the Navy of Nelson, albeit that the accusations of sort of paintwork and polish above everything else are sometimes a little bit exaggerated in pop culture history, they're not without a fairly big kernel of truth, and the sort of the free-thinking, um, very active Royal Navy of the early 19th century had given way to a relatively ossified structure where free-thinking was discouraged and officers who tried to open their, their, their minds back up again quite often got the short end of the stick. Now, you can make for the specifics of that circum of that whole circumstance, you can make arguments for and against what Admiral uh, Tryon was trying to do. But at the end of the day, if your Admiral gives you orders that may or may not end up with your ship smashing into the flagship, that just the tiniest spark of self-aware, intelligent thought would have avoided that circumstance. So I think as kind of a case study of the low point of completely rigid and flexible thinking and blind obedience to orders, that's kind of uh, an epitome of, of it. It's a perfect demonstration of the worst kind of attitudes that can creep into a navy. And luckily, at least to a degree, something that the Royal Navy would then proceed to gradually recover itself from. So in terms of best moments for the Royal Navy, again, not any of the bigger, flashier battles, but I think two... Two points that illustrated the fortunes of the Navy at its best, um, even if they might not have been, in one of those cases, in the best situation. The first of which would be the commissioning of HMS Warrior, because there had been a lot of back and forth in the mid-19th century as Various people tried to compete to introduce new technologies, shell firing guns, steam engines, iron ships, etc. And there was legitimately a technological lead held for various periods of time by other nations, particularly France, with the launch of ships like Napoleon. However, with the commissioning of HMS Warrior um, in response to the French building of the Gloire, that was the Royal Navy basically just throwing the gauntlet down and saying, look, we've had it with this stupid back and forth. We see your advancement and we are replying bigger, better, faster, more heavily protected, more heavily armed. Oh, and by the way, we're going to build an awful lot more of them than you can. Um, if there was ever an expression of industrial superiority and naval might, the commissioning of warrior is hard to beat um, at that point. The other one, which exemplifies the attitude of the Navy, I think, at a point where, unlike with the commissioning of warrior, where the Navy held all the cards, uh, the second one, I think, is where the Navy definitely is on the, on the receiving end of some tough love, and that is during the evacuation of Crete, because... The Germans are invading, it's the middle of World War II, not a tremendous amount has gone particularly well for the British at this point, and the Royal Navy is trying to cover yet another mass evacuation of troops, which at that point had become a distressingly common occurrence, 
And the Royal Navy is getting pasted for it. It's getting ships heavily damaged and ships are being lost at a frightening rate. And all eyes are on Admiral Cunningham, who on paper and by most cold-hearted analysis could have just turned around and said, look, I appreciate the situation the army's in, but we just can't sustain these loss rates. We have to pull back because if we expend ourselves completely here, then tomorrow the Italians are in charge of the Mediterranean. It would have been very cold-hearted, eminently pragmatic, and would have cost an awful lot of lives, and been a massive, and yet another massive defeat for the British in the uh, first half of the, the Second World War. Instead, he came out with a line that I think is pretty much as exemplary for the Navy and as historical as things like Nelson Signal England expects that every man will do his duty, but is unfortunately perhaps slightly less well known, which is he just turned around and said, it takes us three years to build a ship. It takes 300 years to build a naval tradition. The evacuation will continue. And to a man and to a ship, the Royal Navy kept throwing themselves into that cauldron, regardless of how many ships were lost, how many men were killed or wounded, and how many more ships required months in dock. And I think in terms of sort of almost like your your sort of finest hour moment, that epitomizes the best of the Royal Navy. Um, and you see that crop up again, even at certain circumstances in things like the slightly less, uh, less uh, successful parts of the Falklands campaign, where the Royal Navy realized they have a job to do. And yes, it might cost their lives. Yes, it might cost their ships. But this is what they signed up to do, and there's an objective to do, and regardless of what the enemy tries to do to stop them, they are going to pull it off. And Admiral Cunningham did pull it off, and that is, again, one of the reasons why I continue to maintain that both that quote and Admiral Cunningham himself are deeply, deeply underappreciated. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, with the fact that I think a ship is should be named HMS Jellicoe, I think if you're going to name a ship HMS Jellicoe, you've got to put HMS Cunningham up there as well. And so that brings us to the end of Dry Dock episode 81. I hope you have enjoyed yourselves, and I hope uh, to see you back again here soon for another video. Thanks very much.